Three, three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with the Magic Brad Show, and I've got a new friend. He's just down south, 35W in Austin, Texas. His name is Ari, and the last name is Brish. Is that right? Correct. I got it right? Yeah, you got it right. You're a magician. No wonder they call you Magic Brad. That's right. It's, uh, the world is magical to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everything's always different. You never know. Yeah, All things are going. Cool. Might be surprises. <clears throat> so you live down in Austin. How long you been down there? Oh, let me see. Uh, <laughs> almost tw thirty-two years. You don't remember? It's been so long. <laughs> I, I don't remember. So uh, we came here for three years assignment. I used to work for Motorola in Israel. And if, if people wonder where the accent is from, is from Israel, or at least Israeli accent after 32 years in Texas. So it's kind of a, a blend. So anyhow, we, we, I used to work for Motorola in Israel, and they relocated uh, me to Austin with the original plan was for a three years assignment. <laughs> and <laughs> 32 years later, we're still here. My wife is still uh, mad at me for cheating her into that adventure, <laughs> but, but she enjoys it too. I, I like. I think I like it down there. I have not been to Austin, but I've got a niece in Austin and an actor friend of mine that moved out of LA, and he moved uh -huh. to Austin, Texas. And uh, yeah, uh, Austin is one of the most desired cities. Depends which study you 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 read. It, yeah. When we came here, people don't believe us because now it's such a big party city. When we came here in 1988, it was such a sleepy town that if if we had to do some special dinner for breakfast, for birthdays or, or anniversaries, we used to drive to San Antonio because Austin was like a curfew, you know, after seven or eight p.m. Now it's the opposite. San Antonians uh, come to here, and people from all over the world come here because it's a uh, a famous became a famous party city yeah people like it it's a it's i call them more like bohemian cities kind of like Asheville, north carolina and um, uh, um like portland yeah it's kind of like you know las vegas san francisco one of these new orleans one of these uh, older you know a lot of hippies you know, right hippies uh, sin city <laughs> okay. party city whatever whatever your preference is so let's talk a little bit about your business. I did a little bit of poking around, but it looks like you deal a lot with like more, I'm more of a owner operator kind of person, but it sounds like you're dealing more about on the C-level executives. Uh, right, so so as I said, I, I, I worked for Motorola for 20 years, so I have a very strong corporate background and I used to work for another company a few years before. Uh, but in 2002, after 20 years at Motorola, I, I got tired of corporate. Or I would say tired of corporate, but more just looking for something else to do. Yeah. Uh, so I started my uh, venture startup journey in 2002 and uh, never looked back. Uh, there the, are uh, lots of differences and lots of similarities. The, the big similarity is you have to to realize that you deal with people. In yeah. the corporate world, the people are wearing the same badge as you are in most cases. In, in the small business world, most of the people you deal with are, are not part of your business. Uh, so, uh, but, but you have to be sensitive to the human factor. Well, definitely in the small business world, it's a different kind of... Uh there's not so much structure, corporate structure kind of thing. I know that um, I, I uh, did some consulting work with a uh, shop that uh, sold chocolate and they had this, the, the case was this truffle case in the front and they had the display right in the middle. And they had cash yeah. register on each side and everybody would always bottleneck and get caught up in the middle. And yeah. I would say, why don't you move this to the side and then you can filter people around and it'd be so much yeah. easier. And they say, we can't because it's not the corporate way. <laughs> they had their yeah. way. So they were part of a uh, franchise corporate thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, so how did they pay you? With this chocolate or, or with, with money? A <laughs> little bit of that. I remember they have chocolate covered strawberries, and I think you get like three big strawberries, and it's like $65 for them. Oh, wow. Amazing. <laughs> 
it's all yeah, perceived yeah. value, yes? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So uh, going back to your question, you know, I, I've done venture work since 2002. I was a co-founder VP of marketing business development for one startup here in Austin. And then we were acquired by Intel and then I was looking for something else to do and was hired to be a CEO of a company in Israel, even though I, I was based in Austin at the time, but commuted to Israel every other week, which was American Airlines love me. When they see me, they bow. Um, and I did that for four years until 2008 came and kind of put a stop on everything that was going on. The only uh, vertical or, or market segment that was still strong and active back in 2008 was Clintech. So I started to do freelance uh, work for Clintech uh, companies. Started with wind energy, but then migrated to solar and smart grid and green buildings and blah, 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 and, and expanded, slowly, slowly expanded to other industries. So now I'm, you know, what is it, 12 years after 2008, I'm more or less industry agnostic. I had engagements in cosmetics and jewelry and, and oil and gas and, and anything in between. Yeah, I think there's some basics in, in business that is applicable to all industries. But, um, exactly, exactly. And people don't realize that. So people, most people, you know, just go in the same uh, path and they don't realize that they can learn from other industries. So uh, at some point I started to write some notes and blogs about uh, learning from other industries uh, experiences and, and woke up one day and realized I have enough enough material for a book so I published a book I, I saw your book in a very unique name it's yeah. lay an egg and make chicken soup yeah here it is I hope well, I have right I've not read your book and I've not okay yeah, lay an egg and make so I've not read the book and I, so I don't know what it's about but I'm gonna guess that it's sort of like planting the seed. You lay the egg, and right. as that grows, then you can make chicken soup when the chicken gets older. Is exactly. that exactly? So it, it builds on the metaphor of chicken and an egg, but I took it to the next step uh, from a chicken to a chicken soup. And uh, strangely enough, with all the Amazon algorithms, sometimes I pop up in a, in a cookbook uh, section. So it's not a cookbook; it's a business book. <laughs> And, and as you guessed right, it's about growing the business from, from seed or from egg to a successful uh, uh, business or enterprise. The book became bestseller. I didn't intend, number one, I didn't intend to write a book. You know, one day I, my family didn't know I'm writing a book and, and only like two or three months before I published it, I, I told them, hey, I, I wrote a book. Guess what? I wrote a book. So we published the book. It became a bestseller very quickly. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy with that result. But the, the, the theme, many people, or many entrepreneurs, when they start a business, they, they have a great idea. Uh, but in many cases, they, they, they are not aware of all the risks and all the blind spots that they have in, in, in implementing and executing on, on this idea. And, and I uh, dial back, I also, in the past two or three years, I served as mentors in different uh, universities and different accelerators and, and I realized that almost across the board that's an issue with most entrepreneurs they have a brilliant idea yeah but in most cases they don't have a clue on, on how to implement it so my book focus on the implementation implementation aspect most books in the venture uh, category focus on how to come with a new idea and how to raise money for a new idea. And that's where they stop. I, I, in my case, maybe the first 20% of the book is how to come with a new idea and how to raise money, but 80% is how to execute. So eventually, you know, your investors and you will make money at the end of this journey. Right. So <laughs> some people, they get into it, they have this concept and I think that's a great idea. So they got this big vision, but they don't know how to bridge between the vision and right. how to get there. Right. So. right. And, and uh, uh, 
one of the issues that you find, you, you have almost gray hair as my, uh, mo most people with brilliant ideas are, are younger in age, uh, because when you are younger, you, you think out of the box, you, you, you tend to challenge a system. So you come with a good idea, but then because you are young, you don't have the experience on how to execute. So I, I, I have in the book a uh, section about uh, diversity, by the way, and you know, people tend to think about diversity as a, as a racial thing or a gender thing, but it's, it's, that, that's not the issue. The issue is different ways to think about problems, different way to approach problems, different way to, different thinking angle. Like, to more like to a diversified portfolio or diversified, uh, diversified uh, thinking ideas. Right, right. So you need to diverse yourself you know, gender and race is one of them, ethnicity is another, you know, countries of origin is another, religious is another, everything that makes who you are kind of uh, uh, defines the way you, you think and the way you approach problems and even science and engineering. You know, most of my career I worked with engineers and I definitely could see that engineers from different backgrounds tend to think differently even when they approach sure. engineering problems. Yeah, they're stuck in a rut kind of thing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So going back to the age thing, uh, diverse, age diversity in the team is also important for the reasons we talked about. Uh, the gray hair brings some experience to the table where the younger people brings uh, uh, out of the box Thank you. Well, I just had a conversation uh, earlier this morning with a guy and uh, we were talking about, I've got a friend that has a, a party supply company and mm -hmm. the people, they've been around for a long, long time. So the, yeah. the, the people that own the company, they are thinking, I'm going to do a radio ad. And they don't think about this new stuff that they've got right. with, like yes. Facebook ads and yeah. apps yeah. Yeah. and all this technology because right. they don't yeah. get it. So yeah. you need to yeah. get rid of that old thinking and kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Do some unlearning <coughs> and get mm -hmm. back into this new stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not suggesting that every startup needs to hire at least one older pe person uh, because it may not fit the team. If everybody's 20 years old, they're not going to hire a, a 50 years old person in the team. But there is other ways to address it. You can, you know, have mentors. You can have consultants. Um, <clears throat> I know Michael Dell, when he started Dell Computer, he was in his 20s. He, his, he hired all his VPs were 20 years older than him. So he was smart enough to uh, surround himself with lieutenants that are older and more experienced where he was a visionary. Now he's probably the oldest person in the company. <laughs> Well, those are some wise words. Some, uh, you know, to, to diversify the just the age category, even the thinking mm -hmm. styles. Some people right. think they have a different thinking style. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. my yeah. brain tends to toggle, you know, left, right brain all the time. I'm, uh -huh. I'm thinking more analog over here than all of a sudden digital over here. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. before this COVID thing happened, I was in primarily the event industry. Okay, I was yeah. in events, hospitality, travel, and tourism. Oh wow, well, I love travel. And then, well, during COVID, you can't do so much. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you do it. So Zoom I was problem. able to pivot and start doing the uh, online. Yeah. And I'm still using some of my event marketing strategies, but they just happen to be digital meetups and Zooms and things like right. that. Yeah, yeah. Be innovative yeah. about it. So fortunately, yeah. I got this Gemini brain. So I've got, <clears throat> I got my own consultant yeah. inside my head. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when, when diversity started as a social thing, Back in the 80s, people did, did it for, or corporate did it for social justice kind of motivation. But now, 30, 40 years later, there is lots of research that shows that diverse teams are doing somewhere between 50% and 70% better, 50, like 5-0 to 70, 7-0% better business results uh, I would when they have even... a diverse team. Even the diversity of a culture, or cu cultural yeah. diversity within, yeah. because different businesses work. I remember um, a guy was telling me about doing business in Japan. You can't just give him your business card and throw it in your pocket. You yeah. need to yeah. take the business card and respect it. 
Yeah, right. Exactly. So you need to know that stuff to, to be working yeah. from someone from Japan or Saudi Arabia yeah. or wherever. Yeah. Different cultures. Yeah. Different cultures. You know, so you, you need. Uh, that's another point. When when you want to expand internationally. Ah. Okay, let me turn off this. Phone. There is like five million telephones. That might have office. been the clients calling you. Uh, that's my wife's phone. So. Okay. <laughs> That might be more important. We better hurry yeah, up. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so, oops. Oh, somebody's talking there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So where were we about the cultural? Yeah, when you, when you have to expand internationally, when you take your business internationally, if, if you're in a travel business, you know that, and, and, and do business overseas, you have to be very sensitive to the fact that other countries are doing thinking differently and doing but I business. think not even other countries now because <clears throat> the other countries are coming here to the United States so there's so right. many different cultures and yeah. and how people work I know that yeah. um, Amazon had a bunch of issues because of the uh, the Muslim community wanted to be able to take prayer breaks yeah right we're not used to that kind of thing so it's a yeah. whole yeah. different culture you have to adapt to it yeah, exactly and and you know when we came here in 1988 there was very few foreign families in Austin, like in Motorola, there was a handful of foreign families, or foreign employees. Now it's almost a, a standard, at least in the high tech, to have a big portion of, of the team is people coming from other countries. <clears throat> so your book covers a lot of that. Is, do you also do some like like uh, consulting or do you do workshops and seminars and, and yeah, yeah, yes yeah. yeah so uh, as i said i started this mentoring and advising and consulting to other businesses that's what triggered writing the book because i saw common issues among all my clients and mentees that uh, <clears throat> they are not aware of all the practical challenges they are facing so now i, I spend a portion of my time supporting the book and another portion of my time talking about the concept or spreading the, the concept of the book either in, in shows like this, speaking engagements, um, uh, speaking in academia like this morning I was uh, uh, negotiating a, a, a guest speaker in one of the universities here in, in, in Texas uh, and I still continue my consulting, so that's, uh, you know, I have a mixed bag of things I'm sure. doing. So who, who is your ideal customer profile? Is it uh, any specific industry that you like to work with? Any specific age range? Any specific gender? It, it, it was, it used to be high tech 20 years ago, but not anymore. As I said, I diversified myself since 2008 and became totally industry agnostic. At this point, for example, I have four or five clients. One is medical devices, one is clean tech, uh, one is social media, uh, another one that is kind of a logistical software, and the fifth one is in agricultural technology. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All, all, Diversified all different. portfolio. So, yeah, and people hire me because of my network of connections, if they need network or uh, connections into uh, investors, uh, whether they need the connections to um, uh, market and, and you know business development, uh, these are the type of, of engagements I do. Strategic planning for the new business. Uh, so these are the kinds of, in the past I had, as I said, I had jewelry, I had Cosmetics, uh, high tech, of course, energy. So I, I, I became very okay. industry diverse and agnostic, I would say. And, and uh, <laughs> most of this uh, data is on your website, but I have to ask you, what mm -hmm. is CXO 360? What's the CXO for? Okay, so it's a, you ask a simple question, but the answer will be long. Okay. So when. <laughs> When I first left Motorola, CXO stands for, and it still stands for, uh, uh, Chief Anything Officer. So I'm kind of over my career, I did different jobs in engineering, in, in, in R&D, in marketing, in operations. So I became 
also agnostic as far as the business discipline. So the X is agnostic of the business okay, so discipline. Okay, so like CEO, CFO, CEO. Uh, right, right, yeah. Interesting. The 360 is also, you know, a circle of doing anything, everything, but also uh, my office at the time was on Highway 360 in, oh, really? Austin, in Texas. <laughs> So it has a dual meaning, uh, <laughs> the 360. So. so it's CXO360.net for those of you that are listening. I will put that link also in the uh, Thank you. Yeah, the dot com link. was taken somehow by somebody. It's uh, okay. You're more of a networker than you are like that. Right, right. Yeah. So the big part, you ask why people hire me, a big part of it is who I know. They hire me because I know so and so and so and so. Yep. So someone say, hey, Ari, you know anybody that's got like a quarter million dollars they could invest into my new little bread shop? Yeah, right, exactly. Say, sure, talk to Steve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Ari, I don't like to do these too long because people uh, get limited time, you know, so it gives uh -huh. them an opportunity to digest it all. But yeah. I'm going to sign this one off and beam it up to the universe and let people find it with keywords and hashtags and social media links and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I appreciate you having me. Is there anything else you want to add? Any words of wisdom? Oh, just to show, to show the, the picture of the book in case you see it on the bookshelf or something. Yeah, you definitely got that out there because I did see it. And, and who knows? People look at it as a cookbook. That's for cooking up yeah. your new business, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That okay. is a, a cooking metaphor here. Okay. okay, thanks, Ari. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Okay, Peace. thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend.